So hey guys I hope you all doing great. Welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto neglected by his family and becomes a Anbu Black Ops. Part 2. If you guys enjoy this what if. And you want the next part of this video. Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 2. The Namika's compound was bursting with excitement. Well, as much excitement as a kid's party could have. The massive property was filled with important people. Almost all of the clan heads and their children were in attendance, and even a few civilians who were glad their children had been invited by the birthday kids just a few hours ago at the festival. A joyous occasion it was, there was food being served, music being played, and plenty of kid-friendly activities taking place in the training area. The children were continuing their game from earlier in a boys versus girls match that would have been outmatched, had it not been for Mido somehow being able to hold her own against both Menma and Sasuke. While that was going on, the adults remained inside, chatting with one another or spilling the latest gossip around the village. As comical as it is with the people they knew, there was plenty to talk about. For one, it seemed as though Kakashi was stuck to his remaining teammate like glue, with people speculating on their more than friendly relationship, Sanadi and Shizun leading the talk. Then there was Jiraiya, trying his best to talk up a few of the single civilian moms who were adamantly denying his requests. Most of the clan heads, including the Yamanaka, Akamichi, Aburam, Inuzuka, and Hayuga clan heads, were discussing next year's academy class and the training they had done to prepare their children. In the kitchen, Kishina, Yoshino, Mikoto, and Am prepared plates of food for the guests and made sure everything was ready for cake and ice cream later on. Kishina was working like a mindless drone, not even paying attention to what her friends were saying. Her mind was too focused on her forgotten son, as it had been since they parted ways after the Kayubi festival. Still a painfully fresh realization, she just wanted this day to end. It seemed everlasting, as if Kami wanted her to suffer as long as possible. That thought hurt as well. She couldn't even force a smile for her other children on their birthday. This really wasn't how she imagined this day going. It was supposed to be a day of relaxing and fun after the long period of stressful work they had put in over the three years. Stressful in the way that they really didn't make much progress. At the end of it all, Mido and Menma's skills were barely gen and level at best. Of course that isn't too bad for kids not even in the academy yet, but even so. In the same period of time, one of her children excelled to the rank of Anbu. On his own. What did that say about their flawless training schedule? She still couldn't believe it. Any of it. Naruto graduated from the academy at the age of nine. He didn't even stay a full year. Then, he became an Anbu a few months later. It filled her with so many mixed emotions that she didn't know what it was she was supposed to feel. Was she supposed to feel happy for him or sad he never told them? Prideful that her son was such a prodigy or disappointed that he didn't need them. There were just too many possibilities that jumbled together and too many unexplainable variables that threw her for a loop. Mainly Naruto's attitude towards the whole ordeal. His nonchalant manner as if it didn't happen. If he had been angry with them or spiteful then she'd know exactly how to feel. She'd understand her feeling of self-hatred, but she didn't know how to feel about blatant disregard. She could not process the seamless forgiveness he held for them. All it did was hurt more than it would have had he called them out on it or ignored them altogether. When she got home from Ichiraku's, the first thing she did was go up to his room. There was nothing left within it sans a dusty note on his bed. The date it was written is what broke her heart more than the content itself. It was August 21st, Naruto's birthday. The note had explained his reasoning for moving out, highlighting points such as him turning 10 and being an active ninja, therefore making him an adult. Then it talked about not wanting to disturb anybody when he came home late from a mission, him taking up space or using utilities for free when he now had an income to assist in paying. Infusing her as he said, I read in a book that in a well-functioning household, all occupants should pay a portion of the bills as is proper etiquette. It didn't make sense to her that he wouldn't bring the matter up with them before making such a brash decision. Regardless, that day, two years ago, he moved out. And they were just finding out now. What did that say about her mothering skills? She could try and tell herself the schedule was too filling or that he had always been quiet, but she knew it was all bullshit. Just sad attempts to convince herself that she was still salvageable as a caring mother. How could she fault herself on something everyone would do right? Odd, she hated this day so much. The day they had all been waiting for all week long. It was a hellish experience that slowed down second by second every time her heart beat. They hadn't spoken yet, but she knew, she knew Minato was feeling the same way. Break. Walking back into the kitchen, Minato grabbed two more plates from the counter silently. Walking them back out to the guests. A perfectly fake smile plastered expertly on his face as he weaved through the crowded home, searching for someone without a plate. 
Just as he had been doing all day, he greeted everyone who addressed him first. Only giving them quick hellos or chuckles when they threw a joke his way. All for the purpose of masking his agonizing frustration. Naruto and the others parted ways after leaving Ichiraku's as he and Kishina brought Mito and Menma home to get dressed for the festival. After receiving that note from Kishina, a spark lit inside him that wasn't there while at the restaurant. Then, he couldn't even find the words to talk to his son. Now, all he wanted to do was have a conversation with him. To explain things or at the very least get a better feel for how Naruto felt. He couldn't accept that Naruto would just forgive them so easily. There had to be some level of resentment. Maybe just a little, but there just had to be something. In a stroke of good luck for the first time that day, Minato saw Naruto and Itachi walking up the walkway through the window. He decided now was the time. If he put it off any longer he'd go insane. Handing out the final plate, he briskly walked towards the door. Before he made it, it was already opening. Okage-sama. Said Itachi bowing in respect. Minato scratched the back of his head with a bashful smile. Ah, there's no need for that Itachi. Please, come in. He said, stepping aside. Itachi nodded and went further into the house. Spotting someone that caught his attention, he bid the two a farewell, leaving Naruto and Minato at the door. Hello, Tusan. He said holding up the gifts he had brought for Mito and Menma. Would you happen to know where I can place these? He asked. Minato searched around, not really sure where Kishina had set everything up. Um. No, I can't say I do. He replied. Naruto nodded his head and looked around for someone who might. Nodding to his father with a smile, he began to leave. Now or never Minato thought. Uh, hey Naruto. He called out, stopping him before he could leave. Naruto looked at him attentively. Uh, could I talk to you for a bit? He asked, nodding his head up towards the top of the stairs. Of course. May I alert Kasan that I am here? He asked, gesturing towards the kitchen. Minato quickly nodded and tucked his hands into his pockets, now feeling a lot more nervous than he felt just a few minutes ago. As Naruto left, Minato headed upstairs, sure he had gotten the hint it was a conversation to be held in private, away from the people. He stood in his and Kishina's bedroom, pacing back and forth, really thinking about what it was he wanted to say to him. He didn't want to bombard him with questions or just blatantly ask him how he felt. He didn't really want to talk him into it either. Naruto is an Anbu operative, so Minato was sure he'd be able to deduce such a tactic. His plan wasn't interrogation, he just wanted to talk to his son. Break. After dropping off his gifts at the table he spotted in the backyard, Naruto greeted his mother who seemed as awkward as she had at the restaurant. Passing it off as a possible overwhelming of her return, he didn't address it. Now, on his way up the stairs, he tried to guess what it was his father wanted to talk about. Possibly his incredulous growth and how he acquired his dot, he was sure he'd get scolded for not being patient, but Itachi and he were in such a competition, he didn't even think about it. He just had to keep finding something to get ahead of him. Every time, however, Itachi came with something newer and better, so Naruto had to keep up. Before he knew it, he was mastering his father's ceiling notes. Kami, he prayed this didn't have to do with that. Making it to the top of the stairs, he reminisced how long it had been since he'd been there. Everything was just the same. On the way, he passed by his old bedroom, peering inside. He noticed the note was gone, so maybe they had known of his self-training. Finally arriving, he knocked on the door awaiting his father's approval to enter. Hearing the muffled come in, he stepped in and shut the door. Minato was outside on the balcony, overlooking the children in the backyard. Naruto stepped up and stood next to him. He looked down at the way Menma and Sasuke argued as they both drew their plan of action in the dirt for the rest of the boys to see, debating on which would work better. Ah, those two will become something amazing one day. Naruto said, once again kicking off the conversation. Minato didn't reply. He just continued to stare out at the group of kids, segregated by gender, plotting against the opposing side. There was a question resting on his tongue, but he couldn't ask it. He couldn't even speak. That's how much Itachi and I were. Naruto continued, trying to get the man to say anything. Minato only chuckled so lowly, it almost sounded like he just blew more air out of his nose than usual. After a few more painful seconds of silence, Naruto nudged him. So too san. What was it you wished to speak about? Now, with no way to avoid the conversation that he himself requested, Minato cleared his throat, giving himself another few seconds to think about how to word it. Or, at least figure out whatever it was. I, uh. He tried. Naruto watched as his mouth opened and closed noiselessly as if the words were just not there. I wanted to talk to you about it. Well, everything. He said, finally spitting it out. Naruto still didn't fully understand. Was he talking about the various he stole? I apologize. I don't believe I follow you. Naruto replied. Naruto. I want you to understand. I mean. To know that. Your mother and I. The words were just non-existent when he tried to form a sentence. We love you. 
Naruto looked at him just as confused as he had been the entire time. We always have. Processing his words, Naruto's face went through a mixture of emotions including realization, sadness, panic, and worry. He looked at his father in concern. Tusan. Minato waited with his breath caught in his chest. R. Are you and Kasan getting divorced? Minato stared in shock, with a face that asked, where'd you get that idea from? Naruto fished through his pouch. I read in a book that describes this scenario perfectly. First, you and Kasan seemed very tense and detached all day, you barely spoke with one another at lunch, and one of the final steps is pulling the children aside separately so that you can explain it. Minato was at a loss for words. It was such a strange assumption to come to. Stepping back, he could see of course the similarities in the situations, but still. For an Anbu operative, he had assumed he'd be a little more observant and analytical. So stunned, he still hadn't said a word, so Naruto continued on with facts he once read. Sometimes marriages fail when the partners feel as though they are too confined within their everyday life. He said, pulling out a little white book, flipping a few pages. Possibly the training regimen is to blame. Since it is over, may I suggest a vacation sometime in the near future? There are amazing spas within spring country. I read about them when I was young. Whoa, whoa, whoa Minato cut in, finally zoning back into reality. We are not getting divorced, okay? He stated, calming the boy down. That's not it son, I just. I just wanted to let you know that. In case you didn't know. Still Naruto was confused. Well, of course I know that. I mean, why wouldn't I? He asked him. Minato looked at him. No one was this forgiving. Is this about me not telling you of the Anbu thing? Minato didn't get a chance to answer before he continued. I was going to Tucson, honestly. But, you guys were working so hard, I didn't want to bother you. It's not that either. Well, that wasn't all of it. Mustering up the courage to finally discuss it, he stopped, hearing the familiar sound of a shunshin, an Anbu agent appeared on the ledge. He climbed down and bowed in the presence of the Hokage, but addressed the one he was there to retrieve. Horasan. A mission has appeared which requires your team's expertise. The man said. Please gather Weasel San and report to the Anbu HQ within 30 mins. Ah. I understand. He nodded to the man. Once he shunshined away, Naruto turned to Minato. Well. Duty calls and whatnot. He said stepping back inside. Some other time too San. Oh, and let Mito and Menma know I was here. He called out over his shoulder. Damn it. Minato thought. He just missed his chance. Of course, he understood though being in the Anbu himself at one point. When they called, you went, no matter what you had to drop to do so. Next time he got the opportunity, he wasn't wasting it as he had just then. He'd be sure of it. Walking down the street, away from the Namika's compound, Naruto continued to annoy his friend with false kissing noises, teasing him for his infatuation with a girl within his clan, Azumi Acha. Calming down from his previous streak of laughing, he nudged his arm with his elbow, seeing he was upset. Ah come on Itachi. I believe your infatuation with Izumi-san is something to be cherished. It is quite beautiful actually, for those in our profession to find such a connection to someone who hasn't yet seen the things we have is fantastic. It shows that, despite the horrors we have experienced, there is still humanity within you. In the life of Shinobi, maintaining one's humanity is something frowned upon when at war. But, to me, it mattered not. For, I was determined to be more than the kunai they told me I was. Yanyajui, the weapon I was. Naruto said, throwing out a quote from a book that he found suited the situation while citing the author and book verbally. Itachi snickered. You and these quotes. You've got one for everything huh? He asked rhetorically as a way of shifting the conversation. Not quite, sometimes they just fit rather well. He said scratching the back of his head, smiling in embarrassment. Itachi nodded. It would seem as though many of them do. Silence settled in after that while they walked through the streets of the village in the aftermath of the festival. Various pieces of trash from goodies and whatnot lay scattered around the streets. Vendors from out of the village packed up their stuff, ready to head back to wherever they had come. Near midnight, there weren't too many people out and about as everyone left standing were adults who packed into the numerous bars around the village for some late night drinking. As they walked, they were greeted by the few passing Ichiha patrols who nodded in their direction. All the while, Naruto stuck behind the book Itachi gave him and Itachi went within his own thoughts. Itachi. Naruto said, getting his attention. May I ask you what it is like? Itachi raised an eyebrow, unsure of what he meant. To be in love. He clarified. Itachi grunted as is seemingly customary for his clan. H.N., and you'd assume I'd know. Well, of course you would. Naruto said. You are in love with Izumi-san right? She is just a friend. Itachi replied. Naruto looked at him, confused by his denial. But. You show the signs of someone in love. He said rummaging through his pouch pulling out a scroll. He unrolled it and unsealed yet another book. 
Nakami Atsukiya, a marriage counselor of Spring Country, wrote a love novel in which the main character states I know the signs of a man-in-law. You can't get all of your information from fictional writing. Itachi buds in, looking at the book he had in his hand. Naruto looked at him, still as confused as before. Why not? It is usually a good source for a different perspective on most topics. Right. Itachi replied. But they are usually opinions of the author. Not proven fact. Sometimes that is not always the point. Naruto replied, sending him a smile. If you would read a few of them yourself, you would discover things about Itachi Ichiha that you may find interesting. You believe you are not in love, but I could wager my life you are. Naruto said, looking ahead to the HQ that was now in sight. You seem to be in a rush to meet death. He said, receiving a chuckle from the blonde as they entered the building. Break. Opening his locker to adorn his uniform, Naruto continued the conversation. The thing about books is that a man could live a thousand lives if he so wished. Living one good life in reality seems much more fulfilling. Itachi contended. The individuals such as yourself I suppose. For some, hearing what the world means to others is fulfilling as well. Shinobi especially. He debated. How so? Itachi asked, clamping on his forearm guards. Strapping his black sword to his back, Naruto reached up for the top of the locker, pulling down his mask. We are subjected to scenes most people wouldn't even dare write about. On a weekly basis, we view scenes depicting pain, sorrow, hatred, and fear, but not much else. For the lucky few, those things come along with admiration. He said, hinting at Itachi. But, for others, a good book can remind you that there is some good in this world. Without an outlet, we'd lose our minds. So, that's why you read them? Itachi asked, placing his weevil mask on. Naruto put his tiger-painted mask on as well. We all need something. Break. Opening the door to the mission briefing room, Yugao and Hade were already overlooking a map for the mission parameters. Naruto and Itachi walked in and stood at the opposite side of the table. Hade and Yugao were seemingly working out the kinks. When they finished, they nodded to each other and got the attention of their young prodigies. Okay. Hayate began with two small coughs afterwards. This mission is a search and rescue. We will be heading into Sunagakur. Our team was requested due to the claims of the enemy possessing some sort of impressive Jinjutsu. Weevil Sharingan is vital. He explained as the black-haired team nodded in understanding. When we got through that, there was also a claim of our target being locked within some sort of high-class sealing technique, which is where Tor comes in. Receiving his nod of confirmation, he continued. Our target is the son of a rich merchant, Kaijo Nomo. Mr. Nomo received a letter a few weeks ago offering a trade of his own head for his son's life. Being the closest village, we were offered the mission with a major payout. We are expected to face low-ranking nukes, C to possibly B class at best. However, along the quickest route, which is the one we will be taking as time is of the essence, there have been sightings of possible S ranks. He finished. Yu Gao continued after him. Remain light on your toes and stay alert. It is a 12-day trip there on foot. We will be taking the trees which will cut it down to 8. Our estimated Ada is two weeks. Biggie backing off of her, Hey continued. That is, of course, if we are able to retrieve the boy within the first two days of us being there. Let's get in, get the boy, and get out. No unauthorized side missions. He said as Tor and Weevil gave quick bows to their superiors with a simultaneous shout of hi. The team of Anbu operatives departed five minutes later. Happy birthday dear Menma and Mido. Happy birthday to you. The party occupants all sang in unison, cheering as the two blew their candles out. From there, a quieter than usual Kashina cut the massive cake as the women who volunteered to help passed out plates of the delicious sweet to the kids and guests. It was half past midnight, so most of the party goers had retired to their homes, trusting that whatever gift they got for the two would be useful in some way. Kashina's smile had long since faded as she was too tired to even pretend anymore. As Menma and Mido opened gifts, she sat in a chair off to the side, mindlessly staring at something within her line of sight. Glossy-eyed and uninterested at the excitement of the two children she has seen for three years straight. She had never felt so in light of her two prized children before this point. For whatever the reason was, she just wanted them to quit being so joyful. A clear sign of her exhaustion, she held her tongue. Leonardo was at the end of his rope as well. He leaned against the doorframe of the backyard, looking in on Mido and Menma opening present after present, while the kids surrounding them stared in awe. Never before had he felt so mentally and physically drained. Having both fought in and commanded an army in war, that was definitely saying something. Who knew mentally kicking yourself in the ass could drain you so much? After all of the excitement had left the atmosphere and the parents had reached their limit, the party's numbers dwindled bit by bit. Everyone finding it an absolute must have bid the Hokage a good night which he returned systematically, trying to get them out as fast as he could. Before too long, there were only a few remaining stragglers. Mainly those whose wives stayed behind to assist in the cleaning. A little longer and it was just the Ichihas. 
Standing in the doorway, Minato was approached by Figaku for the first time that night. He was so busy that he didn't have much time to associate with anyone other than his brief conversation with his son. Well, I assume by your recent mannerisms that you've learned of your son's success. He asked him in a knowing tone. Minato was too tired to decide if it were meant to be a simple statement or an insult hidden within a question, so he went with the former to avoid any conflict. Yeah. He's amazing. Indeed. Fugaku replied. Those two will far surpass us in time. He continued, gazing out at the view he could see from the porch. Maybe they already have. Minato chuckled at that. From the things I've heard today, I wouldn't doubt it. He is full of surprises, that son of yours. Minato turned to him. How much do you know of him? He asked suddenly. Fugaku peered at him in questioning. Depends on what you're asking. Well. How strong is he really? What are his abilities and what not? Minato stated more than asked. Hearing his wife bidding Kashina goodnight, Fugaku chuckled at the question. I'd advise going to watch the film of their match within the Chunin exams. He said with a smile. I warn you now. It is absolutely spectacular. Minato wanted him to elaborate, but as it had been all day, his luck was against him. Ah, Minato. Said Makoto walking over with Sasuke. Say bye, Sasuke-kun. She said, leading him towards the door. Good night, Menmas Tusan. He said receiving a flick to the ear from his mother. Ow. I mean, Hokage-sama. He corrected me. Makoto shook her head as he jogged out the door. That boy. She said slowly. What are you two talking about? Just many things. Fugaku said a little too hastily. Before he realized his slip of the tongue, he could feel a chilly presence behind him, accented with enough killer intent to make Minato gulp. Turning around, he looked into the playful eyes of his wife. Oh, and what would these so-called man things entail? She asked sweetly. Fugaku gulped as well, looking over to Minato who avoided his eye contact at all costs. Uh. He began, but quickly ended whatever he was about to say as it wasn't wise for his health. Are you okay, dear? She asked, still as sweetly as before. Maybe I should get you home. She finished pushing him out the door gently. Good night, Minato. She said, smiling at him as well. Minato watched them go as they linked arms. Fugaku turned back to him with a face he's seen on many men either leaving or headed to war. He'd spare a brief prayer for the man that night. But, he was glad everyone was finally gone. Break. Walking into the kitchen, he saw Kashina doing the dishes. He stepped up beside her and began to help her. I got it. She said with a flat tone that held an underlining of annoyance. It's fine. I can help. He said pulling out a fresh rag for drying. Kashina let the dishes in her hands drop down, clattering against the metal sink, startling Minato. She looked up to the ceiling in frustration, shutting her eyes and taking a breath to steady herself. Minato. She whispered slowly. I said. I got it. He put the rag and plate down and placed his hands along the edge of the counter to support his weight. His eyes were firmly set on the sink handle that seemed so interesting for some reason. He was thinking of something to say in this situation. No words were coming to mind, but he really wasn't interested in going to bed with an angry Kashina. He had to think of something that could possibly calm her down. She went back to washing the dishes, simply reaching across the man when she had to. Minato looked at her in thought. Maybe reassurance. He doesn't hate us. And that makes it better. She asked immediately as if she had been prepared for that question for a while. No, but. Maybe it means we have a chance to make it right. He said hopefully. Kashina didn't seem convinced. Make it right. She asked once again, dropping the dishes down. Make it right. She bellowed louder. What the hell do you mean make it right? She yelled, dying off, hearing Mito and Menla walk in. She quickly tightened her lips shut and began aggressively scrubbing at a plate that had been clean for a while now. Minato heard the two come in as well, but his eyes were still on the side of Kashina's face. Mentally pleading with her to talk to him so that they could work through it. Mito and Menla looked at the two in worry as they had never really seen them fight before. Neither brave enough to say anything, they just watched as Minato turned around and sighed. Come on you two. It's time for bed. They stood rooted to their spots until he walked over to them, ushering them out of the room. Kashina was left there with her face in her hands and tears falling freely. This life was not going as she had planned out just 12 hours ago. Nothing was right, but everyone acted as if nothing was wrong. Poor masked Anbu ninja of Kanahagakur were perched in a tree, overlooking a temple of some sort. There were a number of nuke ninjas guarding the perimeter. From their position, they couldn't see any under the rank of B. Some of them were minor A's, but all of them high-classed killers that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with at least a Jonin on their own. Among the bunch were two individuals they really had to worry about, Dadara, I was Mad Bomber, and Rojan Kieran, of Kumo. Both S-class killers with amazing abilities that had to be respected. Performing hand signals to speak with each other, Hei commanded Naruto and Itachi to search the back of the temple for any entrance, as he and Yugao decided on a plan of action. 
their main priority was getting the boy. A stealthy approach was the only way to go about it. They couldn't go with an aggressive tactic as the boy could be killed before they reached him. It would be the issue of finding him more than anything. He had the thought of just sending in Naruto and Itachi, as they were the most well equipped for the possible obstacles within, but he opted out seeing the type of manpower the captive was willing to hire for just the outward defense. When hiring men, you want the best of the best to be near you or whatever high value possession you are trying to protect. With two S ranks guarding the door, Hayde actually feared what kind of monster they had inside. Break. Landing in a tree high enough to give them a better vantage point, Naruto and Itachi scoped out the back of the temple. From the naked eye, Naruto couldn't see much. Luckily, Itachi could. Using the Anbu hand signals, he conveyed to the blonde that there was a small hole in the wall. There was some sort of powerful Jinjutsu layered atop of it. But the possible entrance, the two headed back for Yugao and Heide. Break. Heide had gone over the only possible way he saw them doing this successfully, with having Naruto and Itachi going in first to retrieve the boy, as they caused a disturbance from outside to pave a way for their escape. Yugao profusely denied the plan's possibility for success, arguing that they may not find a way in. As unlucky timing would have it, they came back with news of finding a way in. She then argued that they may not be capable of taking down whatever opponent was guarding the objective. Not wanting to waste much more time, Hayat left the decision up to the two of them. Itachi, in turn, left the decision up to Naruto. Weighing the option, he felt as though he and Itachi could take down anyone they faced. He said they could do it, so Hayat and Yugao got into position within the foliage of the front of the temple, as Naruto and Itachi snuck around back again. Itachi instructed Naruto to stare eyed on his heels as he prepared to make the leap for the hole. Naruto, of course, didn't see the hole, but he trusted Itachi's judgment. They had to time it right to avoid detection from the patrolling ninja pacing along the back of the temple. As soon as they could make the jump without alarming them, they did. Landing inside, Itachi and Naruto clung to the ceiling using chakra. They were hidden within the darkness of the corners. Crawling down the halls, Itachi directed them as the entire place was distorted with Jinjutsu. To Naruto, it seemed as if Itachi were simply crawling through walls. Feeling the paths he thought he saw, he was astounded that it was a solid wall. This was a truly impressive Jinjutsu. As they continued along, he could hear the people talking around them, but he couldn't see them. Of course, it would have been easy for Naruto to just dispel its effects on him, but that would take a huge burst of chakra, and it'd give their position away. So, following Itachi was the best option. They crawled deeper and deeper into the facility going down stairways and descending corridors. By now they had to be at least 20 feet below ground. They hadn't seen or heard a guard for a few minutes now, so Itachi was questionable as to if they were even going the right way. Regardless, they continued until they made it to the very end. Finally making it, sure enough, their target was there, chained to a wall and covered in various seals and inkling. Naruto signaled to Itachi asking him why they stopped. Itachi told him the direction of the target and the state he was in. After feeling around for anyone else, they figured they were in the clear for Naruto to dispel it. When he did, he saw the man in his mid-twenties strung up on the wall-like decoration. Itachi and Naruto dropped to the ground soundlessly. They headed for the open room before Naruto stopped Itachi from stepping over the threshold. Itachi stepped back as the blonde dug through his pouch. Pulling out a piece of paper, he wrote a seal on it before balling it up. Then he aimed for the center of the room and tossed it in. As soon as he did, seals all around the room began to light up. There were all kinds from alarm seals, explosive tags, and even barrier seals that would shoot up as soon as someone stepped in, trapping them inside with a dangerous concoction of deadly paper and ink. Itachi signed, how long? Which Naruto replied with, five minutes. Itachi nodded and turned the other way to keep watch. Naruto went to work drawing up a seal that would effectively disable each of the foreign tags in the order that they should be disabled. First, it had to activate the barrier in case the others failed and actually blew. He had to secure the target, so he drew up another one that would inkis him and a separate barrier just in case. And he also had to send one to bring the barrier down on his command if he was successful in disabling the others. The alarm seals were the most important to bring down. He had to figure that they were triggered by the barrier activating. So, before anything, he had to disrupt those. Itachi peeked back, checking to see if the blonde was done or not. He watched him working diligently and knew he figured out how to do it by how fast he was scribbling. Naruto got the idea to use very high-powered chakra draining seals. Alarming seals like those worked by overloading the seal with chakra, when exposed to foreign chakra, they emitted a very high screeching sound that most any ninja could hear from a mile away. So, with his very high-powered chakra draining seals, he drained them before they ever got the chance to work. Now ready, he first successfully disabled the alarming seals. They weren't able to emit even the slightest squeak before they were drained. Then, he threw in his own barrier seal at the target's forehead, coating him in a small barrier. Next he threw in three other seals all simultaneously. 
Immediately the barrier flew up around the room, causing his first seal to burn away. Then, the explosive tags around the room fell from their positions around the room, crumbling before they even hit the ground. When all of the seals were dealt with, Naruto waited for a few seconds more. Nodding, he looked back at Itachi telling him it's done. Walking over, Itachi stood next to the blonde as he performed hand signs. His last tag fizzed out along with the barrier and the four tags placed around the room. They walked into the room with no issue. Making it to the young man, Naruto again performed a hand sign, and his barrier seal fell from his forehead. Now, the challenge was getting the seal off of the man so that he could be removed from the temple. He knew of the seal, he read about it once when he was just learning ninjutsu techniques. It was a seal directly linked to the sealer's chakra, so anything that happened to it could be felt. It was commonly used within Hazuki Castle, better known as Blood Prison. If they were to try and sneak him out of there, they'd kill him. The only way to dispel the seal is for the sealer to do so manually or to kill the sealer. To do so, they'd have to alarm him. Naruto devised a plan. First, he put up some fake alarm and explosive tags. He'd also put up his own barrier seals that would have the added benefit of cancelling sound. He'd sneak another mini barrier tag on the back of their objective to keep him protected. With Itachi and him, fighting in such a small room would give them the advantage over whoever it was they had to face. When Itachi agreed he was ready, Naruto purposely tampered with the man's seal incorrectly, scorching his hand a bit. When he did, he jumped back up to the ceiling, melding into the shadows just as Itachi was. There, they waited for someone to come check on the seal. Five minutes passed and absolutely nothing happened. Itachi asked Naruto if maybe he should try it again. Naruto only shook his head stating, someone will come. So they waited and waited until finally, they could hear footsteps slowly descending the hall. There was only one set of footsteps which gave them a much more positive approach to the situation. This would be easy. The footsteps got closer and closer, with each step they were filled with more and more dread. They couldn't describe the feeling, it was like an overwhelming feeling of anxiety. Being as experienced as they are, they brushed it off and held their position. Whoever this was would not go down as easily as they had hoped. The footsteps stopped abruptly at the doorstep. Naruto was worried they would just examine the seal from that distance which would ruin their plan. Luckily, they continued in. Immediately, their blood ran cold. Walking up to the man was none other than the snake Sanin himself, Orochimaru. Chuckling in his psychotic way, he addressed the incapacitated man directly. Let's see what's wrong with your seal. He said looking at it. Itachi got Naruto's attention, telling him now. Naruto acted quickly throwing the barrier up and dropping down on the man. As if he had known of their plan the entire time, Orochimaru turned around, dodging their attacks and kicking them back into the barrier. Chuckling again, he addressed them. Minato's lapdogs. Coming to interrupt my little deal, huh? He asked, standing in his spot completely unfazed by their presence. You two look awfully young for Anbu. Naruto and Itachi stay crouched in their own positions, ready for the snake to strike. Both of them riddled in fear, but determined to complete the task or at this point survive. Ah. I know who you are. He said, shocking them. They slowly got into positions to which they could attack him. The two brats from that Kumo exam, huh? Itachi Ichiha and Naruto Namikas. He finished with a chuckle. Yes, it must be. I can feel the power oozing from your bodies. He watched the two giving hand signs that he didn't know as they change every three years. Well, the Sharingan is truly a great gift, and with Anamikas, I'm absolutely blessed. Now, who shall I take first? He asked again with his twisted chuckle. Naruto and Itachi took the initiative, lunging at him. Naruto was the first to engage him, throwing a right hook that was of course easily dodged, he followed up with a spinning back kick that was blocked, throwing him off balance. Itachi came in next with a kunai in hand, slashing and slicing into nothing but air, as the Sanin easily dodged each attack even within such a confined room. Hatching his wrist, Orochimaru kicked him in the chest, plucking the kunai from his hand. Naruto came in next with his black sword drawn, swinging expertly at the man that narrowly dodged each attack. Using the kunai, he parried the attack close to the base of the blade, causing it to fly from Naruto's hand. Itachi jumped up, catching the blade in mid-air, and began delivering another series of strikes towards the slippery man. As Itachi kept him on the defense, Naruto went low, kicking at the back of the man's knee, sending him to the ground. Itachi went for a piercing blow to his chest that was blocked when Orochimaru kicked his wrist. Naruto flew in with a flying axe kick that connected with the bottom of the barrier as Orochimaru rolled away. Itachi went in for a drop kick that missed the snake by an inch when he sidestepped, kicking him away. Naruto flipped away from the kunai that soared his way. He drew two of his own and headed back in. He slashed at the man, trying to get some kind of hit, but was blocked at every strike. Orochimaru forcefully opened his guard, giving him a vicious kick to the chest, sending him back towards a charging Itachi. Itachi flipped over him, grabbing his hand to stop him from hitting the barrier. 
He kept charging, going in feigning a right hook, he delivered a back kick to the man's chest. Orochimaru took the kick and dodged a follow-up kunai slash. Itachi then suddenly ducked as Naruto came flying in with a kick that Orochimaru leaned back to avoid. He then jumped, avoiding the slash at his feet from Itachi. In doing so, it opened itself up for Naruto's follow-up left back kick that caught him in the face. As he spun with the kick, he dodged Itachi's kunai that came soaring towards his face. Rolling forward, he picked it up and parried Naruto's slash with his own, sending the blonde's kunai flying over his head. Naruto rolled backwards, avoiding the slash at his chest as Itachi jumped over him in a somersault, kicking the airborne kunai down into the right leg of the snake Sanon, who wasn't expecting such a maneuver. Seeing he was injured, the two ran in delivering blow after blow that was still either blocked or dodged. Orochimaru plucked the kunai from his leg, tossing it at the charging duo that split to avoid it. Itachi slid on his side at the snake that jumped over him, coming back down for a stomp to his chest. He rolled away and Naruto came in to cover his escape with a series of punches that all seemed to miss. Orochimaru jumped back to avoid Itachi's axe kick. Naruto leaped over his partner and went for a kick to the man's chest that slipped past him. Itachi got back up and went for a roundhouse kick that Orochimaru ducked under to avoid. He gave the brunette a very hard kick that sent him back to the other barrier, leaving him struggling to stand back to his feet. Naruto tried for a right hook that slipped past his face, Orochimaru clamped down on his wrist. He ducked under his arm bringing his wrist with him. With a gentle jerk, he snapped his arm with a sickening crack. Using the broken appendage, he swung the blonde around and threw him at his partner who still hadn't made it to his feet. Tuckling, Orochimaru crossed his arms, staring at the two. Well done. I commend you for landing a few blows. He said pacing over to the man still chained to the wall. He performed a few hand signs and placed his fingers on the man's back. The barrier Naruto put up for the man faded away. You two have piqued my interest. For that reason alone. I have decided to spare you. He said going through more hand signs. He then placed his hand on the man's chest and the seal sucked back into his palm. I'll be seeing you too soon he said walking back towards the exit. As if it were his own seal, he performed hand signs and the barrier faded. Naruto and Itachi remained there, shocked at the unexplainable turn of events. Not wanting to waste the opportunity for escape, they immediately left the area with a man slung across their shoulders. Walking out of the temple, they noticed the lack of its previous occupants. As if everyone just packed up and left. On their way out, they were joined by a very confused Yugao and Haid. They explained that everyone just walked out the front door and left. The entire group of ninja just left the temple. When asked what happened, the two explained their battle with Orochimaru and his ominous warning afterwards. Yugao and Haid agreed it was strange that he didn't just kill them or capture them, but just choked it up to the psychotic man's delusions. With their mission strangely completed, the group left the area to deliver the package. Chapter 3 Rubbing his forehead in frustration, Minato signed yet another document. He had almost forgotten of this hell over the three-year break. It was the one thing he didn't miss about his duty which is ironic as it is most of the job. The past two weeks were anything other than easy for him. The forms continued coming and coming. Document after document was placed before him as soon as he retook office. It was like the workload just grew during his time away. Of course, it was expected and he did it with a smile. Well, as much of a smile as he could give with the exhaustion from everything that had been happening. Over the two-week period, the kids were becoming absolutely unbearable. They wanted to spend time with him every day when he got home. It seemed they became reliant on his presence during their training, so losing that constant connection threw their world for a loop. It pained him to tell them no, but he had no choice. One can only take so much stress before they give. Luckily he had Kashina back to her normal self after a week of the revealing day. That first week after Naruto's departure, Kashina was far from her usual self. A smile on the woman was near non-existent, and for a while, it seemed like it was gone for good. Nido and Menma noticed a change in their mother as well. A week later, they asked Minato if they were getting a divorce, apparently having the same thought as Naruto. At that point, Minato knew he had to speak with her about the way she was affecting the kids. He sat her down and listened to her rant on and on about how worthless she was as a mother and how she shouldn't have been allowed to have children in the first place. He let her pour all that negativity out to him in private as she cried on his shoulder. When she was finished, he told her of his conversation with Naruto. He explained that Naruto was truly not mad about the whole ordeal. When she couldn't accept that, he explained to her the plan he had of organizing a family vacation in a few months. They'd integrate the blonde back into their everyday routine as often as they could. Doing things like inviting him to dinner, asking him for help with the kids' training or just spending time with them. Ashina still wasn't back to her true self, but she had started to cheer up a bit more. She began spending more and more time with her friends she had been so out of touch with. A few days after Minato's plan was revealed, she felt it necessary to ask them for advice. 
To do so, she had to open up to them and run the risk of being judged or possibly ostracized. To her surprise, they were very supportive. Of course disappointed in her, they understood the situation and could tell her regret was real and not just an attempt to save face. That in itself took a huge load off of Minato's shoulders. Now he was sure his wife was speaking with someone about the ordeal and was getting help. It reassured him it would be alright in the long run. Now, all he was doing was awaiting his son's return which was still stressing him out. He read through the mission parameters and saw that there was more than a small chance they'd run into a few S-rank ninja. Their scheduled data was two days ago, but underestimating mission completion times was common, even for Anbu commanders. This was the first time he has known of one of his children actually being out on a mission. When Naruto was born, he had always imagined seeing him off on his first venture out of the village. Having missed that chance, he was giddy to see the boy return from the first one he would see. Still a strange concept that it would be from an Anbu mission, but nevertheless it would be something he'd remember forever. His anxiety only increased as the hours passed by and the day neared its end as the previous one had. He knew not every day was promised, and with Anbu, no matter how strong you are, your chances of making it back are still slim. Watching the footage of their Chunin exams battle is what put his mind at ease. Itachi and Naruto were absolutely amazing. He had never been filled with such pride in his life. Not only seeing his son using his technique, but representing his family name with pride regardless of his mistreatment. He was amazed completely, so much so that he watched it every single day. If that was their strength from just a year ago, he actually feared what they were now, adding to fact their Anbu training. They were possibly nearing the strongest pair in Kanoha. That film reassured him that they would be absolutely fine, no matter who the opponent was. Well, there were a few exceptions. Four Anbu agents kneeled before their cage within the late hours of the night. Minato stood to his feet, finally seeing the one group he was dying to welcome back. Ah, Squad 9. He said with a bit more glee in his voice than he meant to put. Welcome back. He quipped looking down at the one he knew was Naruto, thanks to the unmistakable blonde hair. The four stood to their feet, standing at attention, awaiting the order to report. Minato however wasn't even completely aware of the situation yet. His smiling face was too busy admiring his son in his Anbu uniform. The pride in his eyes was visible for miles. Wow. He whispered out, a bit louder than he planned. The cough from the commander woke him up. Hokage-sama. My apologies, but I believe a report is due. Minato shook his head, giving a fatherly appraising nod to his son one last time. Right, I apologize. Please, report. He said sitting back down. Hey, it began with explaining their few near run-ins, with certain S-rank missing ninja heading up to Kusagakur, the events that happened upon their immediate arrival, and the barely significant events that happened while Naruto and Itachi were inside. When he reported all he could, he passed the responsibility on to Itachi and Naruto, who then explained the events that happened during their venture into the temple, including their brief yet brutal battle against the snake San and Arachimaru. At the mention of the snake, Minato sent word to retrieve Jiraiya from wherever he was. The group continued giving their report by explaining the events that happened after delivering the man back to his father and them receiving the payment. Their trip home was apparently a lot scarcer with the S-rank Newt Ninja than the trip there. With the report done, Jiraiya was ushered into the room in which Naruto and Itachi were again asked to recount their squabble with the man. Hmm. It's very uncommon for him to let go of such talent. Jiraiya mused as he leaned against the window ceiling. Did he say anything else? He asked the boys. No sir, Jiraiya-sama. Itachi replied. Just that he would be seeing us soon. Jiraiya rubbed his chin and thought. Could be a threat towards the village. He said at last. That's the only common ground in which he is sure they will most likely be. In that case, I propose you start looking for him instead. Minato said. If you are to find him, do not engage until you know of his plan. Ureya nodded and leaped out the window to get ready for his venture out of the village once more. As for you four, you are dismissed. He said as they bowed, giving a simultaneous shout of hi before making their exit. Uh, Tora. Stay for a second please. He called out. Naruto stood in his spot waiting for the others to file out. When it was just the two of them, Minato's smile grew tenfold. Wow. Look at you. He said, grabbing his shoulders firmly. Naruto plucked his mask from his face and smiled back as he scratched the back of his head. Ah, Tusan. I appreciate your flattery. My boy. In Anbu. He said with a chuckle, grabbing his head with his hand. I can't believe it. How was the mission? Were you hurt? He asked suddenly. No sir. I was only inflicted with minor injuries from my battle with Arachimaru-san. He said, wiggling his now healed arm. I have some knowledge in medicine, so I was successfully able to heal my injuries, as well as the few imposed upon Itachi. Minato was taken back again, if at all possible, his smile increased again. Do you even know medical he asked in amazement. Gosh son, you're already more adept at the ninja arts than even me. He complimented me. 
Naruto's bashful smile only increased from the praise his father was giving him. Ah, I am not at your level of expertise yet too san I am merely adequate in various subjects. I have yet to master any. He said, knocking himself down a bit. Oh, you're too humble, son. I mean, you've figured out my Horatian. Jiraiya is a seal master and has yet to do that. Minato continued. I guess that is true, but I did so with your teaching. If I am correct, Jiraiya is attempting to reproduce the formula from scratch. He stated once again. That's right, he is. But, I can't take credit for teaching you. He said as his smile faltered a bit, but held strong. Naruto noticed and reassured him. I read your description of how you engineered the seal by dissecting the formula of the Nidane, Tabarama Senju, to make it faster and much more proficient in battle. From there, you went on to explain how it works and what you needed to do to perform the technique. All I did was follow your advice. Minato just smiled bashfully at his modest son. He begrudgingly accepted the praise he didn't feel he deserved, knowing if he refused it the boy would just argue another point. Well, you're very near surpassing this old man. That's for sure. He said with a chuckle. Ah, I'm not too sure about Tusan. But, if you say so. Naruto finished. Minato nodded at his son once more, his eyes still filled with pride. A few seconds of silence settled in as Minato just examined how much he reminded him of himself when he was in Anbu. Of course he was a lot older than Naruto is, but even so, the resemblance was uncanny. Well. He said standing up straight. I bet you're tired. Yes, sir. A few days of tree hopping has taken a lot out of my body. A good night's rest will be more than enough to replenish me fully. Naruto replied. Well, don't let me keep you. He said, extending his arm. Naruto shook his father's hand with a smile and a nod. Oh, and if you'd like, your mother would really enjoy having you over for breakfast in the morning. He said as Naruto was walking out. Slowing his pace, Naruto nodded his head. Yes, that sounds fantastic. He nodded on his way out. What time would be acceptable for my arrival? Oh, a uh, possibly nine. Minato replied. Naruto nodded again. Yes, sir. I will attend. He said waving back to the man with a smile. Minato waved back at him with a smile of his own. His heart was racing for some reason. There was a warm feeling in his chest that he couldn't exactly explain. Things are going to be better now. He just knew it. The next morning, Naruto walked up the stone path leading to the front door of his old home, his black book in hand hiding his face. He was dressed in his casual wear which was his black pants and shirt, accented by his white Namika's jacket. Knocking on the door, he heard the girly shout of his sister informing the others I got it. He waited for a few more seconds, listening to her small feet charge towards the door. When it swung open, her eyes looked up into his. It's Nai-san. She informed me. Hello, Imado. Naruto greeted as he stepped inside. Are you here to have breakfast with us? She asked him. Naruto finished kicking his shoes off his feet. Yes, I am. He smiled at her. She smiled back. Ka-san made a big breakfast today. She said, grabbing his hand and dragging him towards the kitchen, as if he didn't already know where it was. The two walked into the room in which Minato and Menma were already at the table waiting to eat. Naruto smiled when they looked his way. Hey. Nai-san. I saved you a seat. Menma yelled out, adamantly patting the seat next to his. Naruto walked over to him with a smile. Thank you Itaudo. He said. Good morning Tusan. Morning son. Minato replied as he stood up to shake his hand. Your mother will be right out, she just stepped back in the kitchen to get the rest of the food. He said as Naruto looked in that direction. I think I will help. He said walking into the kitchen. He saw his mother with her back to the door as her hands fidgeted around the counter, unsure of what to bring first. Good morning Kasan. Naruto greeted me with a smile. Ashina yelped loudly as she spun around. Oh oh. Naruto-kun. She said with a clearly forced smile that was in place to hide her nervousness. To her surprise, the blonde boy that was nearing her height walked over to her and embraced her in a hug. Here. He said, grabbing her extra pair of potholders. Let me help you. He grabbed one of the remaining two dishes she had on the counter and carried it out with Kishina right behind him. Ugh, finally the food here. Nito shouted in relief. I'm starving. Menma, in his ever-present need to annoy her, quipped, you're always starving. That's all it took to kick off their first argument of the day. The others as always zoned out as Kashina and Naruto set the last two dishes down. As soon as they took their seats, everyone began serving themselves. For a while, the actual conversation remained silent as Menma and Nito continued their argument around the bites of food they inhaled. Naruto, Minato, and Kashina just listened to each other with different expressions. Minato in indifference, Kashina in embarrassment, and Naruto in amusement. Eventually Naruto buds in. You two sure do fight a lot don't you? Nito was the first to reply. It's Bakamenma's fault. He's always annoying me. She said, shoveling another mouthful into her face. Yeah right. It's always her who starts it. 
he refuted, completely disregarding the blatant fact that it was actually him who started it this time. Ashina pushed the hair from her face and coughed into her hand to draw attention to herself. Menma, please use your inside voice. Menma knew it was meant in a much more threatening way than it was said and shrunk back into his seat a little bit. Naruto noticed and chuckled at the commanding power of his mother. You know Kasan. He said, grabbing her attention. You may just be the scariest mom in Kanoha. She smiled bashfully as she knew it was meant as a compliment. Although, some of the Nara children could argue it is in fact Yoshino-sama. Ashina smiled. Oh, Yoshino's actually pretty nice if you get to know her. Indeed. I have only briefly met her, but during that time, she was looking for her son, Shikamaru, with a frying pan in hand. I am sure what happened when she caught him was far from pleasant. He said smiling. Kishina smiled at that. Minato chose then to add in. I'd throw Makoto into that wager as well. What? Makoto-chan isn't that bad. Kishina said. Minato chuckled. Um, I've heard stories. Kishina chuckled as well. She knew her best friend was a bit fear-inducing at times, but it wasn't to an extreme degree. The duration of the family breakfast went by without a hitch after the conversation was started. They spoke of all kinds of things from the old missions Minato and Kishina had been on, to Naruto's first mission. They were for a brief moment a normal family like they were supposed to be. That fact alone is what put Kishina's mind at rest. For the first part of the meal, she was still a bit timid about Naruto's uncaring attitude at his neglect, but now, she was feeling as though they were closer than ever, which of course they were. The family event came to an end when Minato finally had to head to work, leaving Kishina and the kids at the house. With their newfound energy from the meal, they begged Kishina to let them show Naruto how strong they had gotten. Kishina at first denied the request, explaining to them that Naruto was too tired from the long two-week mission he had just come back from, but Naruto told her it was fine. Break. Now, the three stood in the backyard. Kishina sat on the porch as she watched Menma and Mito face off against their older brother, who, much as Kakashi often did to them, pulled out a book to read as a way to infuriate them. She chuckled at their frustrated expressions, finding it cute that they still let it get to them. Their teamwork was clearly present in an attempt at least as Mito went around Naruto so that they could attack him from different directions. Don't underestimate us Nai-san. Yelled Menma as he threw a kunai his way charging in behind it. Without looking up, Naruto smiled and plucked the kunai out of the air with ease. Tossing it over his shoulder, he could hear Mito jump out of the way. Hatching Menma's wild haymaker, Naruto shifted his body over slightly, causing the blonde to sail over his shoulder, crashing into his sister. Ugh. Menma Baka. Get out of my way. She yelled pushing him over as she charged the blonde with his back to her. She went for a roundhouse kick to his face from the back that he simply put his free hand up to block. Hatching her ankle, he yanked her gently as she flipped to stay upright. Menma went in for a drop kick that Naruto stepped out of the way of. Sadly for Menma, Mito had been going for an axe kick that he didn't see. Her heel came crashing down on his chest. Ah. Quit hitting me. You idiot. He yelled at her. Then get out of the way. She yelled back, flipping to her feet and squaring off against Naruto in her tojutsu stance. Naruto just kept reading his book. When Mito charged, she pulled a kunai midway to her target. Naruto, still without looking, dodged each of her attacks as he poked at the back of her hand with taps she found to be completely ineffective. That is until her kunai slipped from her hand and she instead tried to punch him in his face. Naruto didn't dodge it. In doing so, she jammed three of her fingers. Jumping back, she finally noticed her hand, for some unknown reason, refused to close. Menma came in next with a Rasengan at full blast. Naruto awaited the attack and leaned slightly out of the way, delivering a jab towards Menma's bicep. Instantly, the ball of chakra dispersed and he was sent stumbling forward. As he tried to catch himself, he realized only his left arm would move. His right just wouldn't extend, in fact he couldn't even feel it anymore. He looked over at Mito who was still cradling her unresponsive hand. Without saying anything, both of them knew the other was done, and so did Naruto. You two are not bad at all. Individually you could outclass most anyone in your class, but your teamwork is poor. So poor, I doubt you'd be able to function properly on a battlefield in any situation. They both looked down in shame. Hanoha operates mainly on teamwork. It will be your most valuable skill when it's time to become an active ninja. He is right for you too. Your father has told you this as well before. Kishina added from the side. Hearing it from Naruto should drive that point home. Yes, Ka-san. The two replied simultaneously. The group was surprised when an Anbu agent dropped down next to Naruto. He whispered something into his ear which Naruto nodded at. When the man sunshine away, Naruto addressed the others. It would seem I have been requested elsewhere. He said as he walked up grabbing onto Mito's hand and Menma's shoulder. Green chakra encased his hands. When it died out, the two rolled out their respective injuries in amazement as they could now move them again. Naruto walked back towards the porch to bid his mother a good day. 
Thank you Ka-san for the amazing breakfast. It was as great as I had remembered it. He embraced her in a hug. Thank you Naruto. You're always welcome to join us. Whenever you want to. She replied as he nodded with a smile. Waving on his way out, he left the compound to whatever it was he was called to. Leaving Kashina, Mito and Menma to continue their training with a new plan. Focus on teamwork. Hours later, the night sky swallowed the remnants of Kanoha's daily activity, handing the reins over to the nightlife of bar hopping or late night dinner dates. It was around this time that Naruto and Itachi were walking out of the Anbu HQ. A whole day spent listening to briefing after briefing, the two were exhausted and hungry. Their feet brought them towards the side of town that held many of the family-friendly restaurants and stands. They were still discussing the topics they were briefed on over the hour-long meeting. It was a mandatory, last-minute, event that was originally just to congratulate and send off the newly retired Anbu captain, Kenji Haro. The man was handing down the title to another one of their superior officers and a former student of his, Commander Amariyasha. From there, the speaker decided then would be the best time to not only refresh the group on the regulations set by Shikaku Nara during his brief time as acting Hokage, but also inform them of the regulations the Yandame had added to the mix. Naruto wondered the entire time just how long his father had been working on such a thing. With all of that nonsense out of the way, the two boys were on their way to enjoy themselves a nice meal somewhere. They just couldn't decide where. In their venture to find a place suitable enough to appease their immense hunger, they ran into someone that Itachi immediately wished they had not. Hey, Itachi-kun. A girl with black hair and eyes to match said as she and a man resembling her perfectly walked over towards the duo. Hello, Naruto-san. Izumi. Hello. Naruto quipped with a friendly smile that held a hint of devious intent that Itachi noticed. What a wonderful surprise. Itachi saw the gleam in the blonde's eyes from the side of his own, but decided not to react, as doing so may actually cause the blonde to do something Itachi didn't want. Hello, Izumi-chan, Komi-san. He said addressing her and her father. Hello to you two as well, Itachi and Naruto. The man said with a smile. What are you two doing out so late? Itachi asked curiously. Izumi looked a little hurt by the question for some reason. W well, it's my birthday and all, so Tu san was teaching me a new technique. Itachi stiffened almost unnoticeably at the mention of the girl's birthday. He had completely forgotten about it with the day's chaotic events. Trying to play it with indifference, he simply nodded, hoping no one noticed his subtle reaction. Of course, he knew for a fact one person did without a doubt. Well. Naruto said, breaking the awkward silence that settled following Itachi's silent reply. I wish you a happy birthday. I must apologize, as I had almost completely forgotten about the joyous occasion this morning as we were heading to our meeting. Almost of course, as Itachi was there to bug me about it the whole way through. He said covering for his friend flawlessly. Itachi mentally thanked his friend for being so aware and helpful. He watched as Izumi's eyes lit up in happiness as her father laughed. He had no words as he simply smiled and accepted the story Naruto had made for his cover-up. Homusama. May I ask of you the honor of having your daughter join us for dinner tonight, as a way of both making it up to Izumi and repaying Itachi for reminding me? Naruto asked with his ever-present intellectual speech pattern. Homu looked at Izumi's pleading eyes and then at the faces of the two boys. Well, if it were anyone else, I'd say no. But, with Itachi and the son of Yandame, I am sure she is in good hands. He said with a nod. You kids have fun. With that said he walked off, leaving the three kids standing in the street, two of them in embarrassment and the other in wonder. Break. They all sat in a booth at the Akamichi bar and grill. Naruto sat on one side as Izumi and Itachi sat on the other, trying their hardest to avoid each other's eye contact. Naruto was once again stuck in the book Itachi had bought for him, and Itachi was at that moment cursing the book for capturing the blonde's attention so intently. It was a bit of a paradox, as when it came to Naruto, he could get any conversation going with ease, but with his limited human interaction outside of books, he knew very little on what questions or topics were appropriate for certain situations. His current fear was that the blonde would start talking, and he'd ask Izumi something stupid that would pit them as a couple. A fear he wouldn't admit was that he'd ask that question, and she'd be speaking of someone else when she answered. Glancing over at her hand that was laid out on the table, he noticed a few scorch marks around her fingers. He smiled as he immediately knew the technique she had been working on, as he had the same injuries at one time. To his satisfaction and discomfort, the food finally arrived. The discomfort came as he knew Naruto's table etiquette would prevent him from reading during a meal. Reading at the table was no crime, but reading once the food arrived was taboo. When the waitress passed out the individual plates and took her leave, the table was covered in silence. The only sound coming from the clanking of their shifting glasses and the chattering of the other patrons. Naruto hadn't noticed as he was stuck on a very good part in his book. The silence was incredibly uncomfortable, and he could just sense their collective discomfort. With his extensive knowledge of these circumstances, he planned for a joke. 
seeing as Itachi was the table's common ground, he'd use him as the focal point. So, Izumi-san. He began. You are finally 12 years of age. Izumi swallowed the food in her mouth so that she could answer. Nodding her head and covering her mouth to prevent excess food from flying out, yes I am. She said, glad someone had finally said something. Well, the just leaves little Itachi here, huh? He said, nudging at the boy's age receiving a chuckle from Izumi. Itachi executed the Ichiha infamous HN at the jab. For just three more weeks. He argued. Ah, you're still a baby for three more weeks. Izumi added, receiving a chuckle from the blonde across the table and a deadpan look from the brunette. I appear to be the most mature at this table. He said with a face of indifference, but they could both tell there was a hint of amusement or relief in his voice. Besides, you two are merely a few months older than me. He said. Astute observation. Naruto remarked. I am only joking. You will get it when you are older. He said as he and Izumi cackled up at Itachi's look of annoyance. As he has been doing more and more recently, Naruto successfully broke the tense silence that the table was drenched in upon their arrival. Then, when everything got rolling and he finished his meal, he pulled out his book and simply listened to the two flirt with each other for the next hour or two. He found it to be something unique to see up close. The blossoming of love was being played out before his eyes. In a book he read, the author explained his own theory of the concept of love as being our human minds, becoming over-infatuated with another person to a degree that is dangerous in a self-implosion standpoint. Naruto took that as saying falling in love was the equivalent of dooming yourself to death. For, if you fall in love with someone weaker and you lose them, your judgment is clouded and you are no longer who you were as you fight for one thing and one thing only. Vengeance. Looking at the two from where he was sitting, Naruto felt it was a possibility that seemed to present itself at this very moment. There was a piece of him that didn't want their relationship to flourish, not out of jealousy, strictly for the safety of his best friend. He didn't have too many real connections in this world, so this was one he couldn't lose. Having Itachi for a friend is what fed Naruto's belief that any man could be more than the selfish and cruel creatures he's seen in his life. For, Itachi is a killer. Not a murder, just a man following orders, but a killer nonetheless. For a boy who has taken countless lives to retain the pieces of him that keep him human, Naruto was convinced that Itachi was a light within this dim world he's come accustomed to. Itachi inspired him to see through the pain and sorrow and to look towards the future. The future being the next generation. Before meeting Itachi, Naruto was a hateful individual. Not verbally, but he was very pessimistic in his way of thinking. Of course, for a lonely little boy, it was an inevitable outcome. Then he met the boy without a smile, but with lots of love. For a while, they butt heads with their clashing ideals, but eventually, Naruto was shown something so beautiful, his heart was touched with a grip of warmth he hadn't felt in years. A new way of viewing the shitty things that happened on a daily basis. Ironically, it was a few days after their first kill, the day in which he believed Itachi would see his views and realize how cruel and vicious human beings are. Something he himself had read in his books. To his surprise, while following his partner, he watched him interact with people as if nothing had happened. He expected Itachi to seclude himself much as he had the first day. He expected him to stray far away from family for fear of them witnessing the monster he had become. In his childlike mind, he believed Itachi was just naive to the core. He felt that he just didn't understand what it was he had done. When he got the chance, he approached him with a heated argument, trying to convince him he was a monster like he felt himself. All Itachi said was that he was not. When he stood up and began walking away, Naruto was almost compelled to follow him. When they finally stopped, they were standing on a cliff overlooking the woods. Naruto was confused as to the reason they were up there. He just watched as the brunette stared out at nothing. He asked him what it was they were supposed to be looking for, but Itachi just told him it's beautiful isn't it? Naruto tried to see what it was he was talking about, but all he saw were scarred up trees and people yelling at each other. When he spoke on it, Itachi only smiled and said, you only see what you wish for. But, it is worth saying that you know what ugly looks like. Therefore you must know beauty as well. With those wise words, he turned and walked away, leaving the blonde standing at the top of that cliff, seeing things a lot clearer than he had just a few moments ago. It's like saying there can't truly be darkness if there is no light to compare it to. Those words got him thinking over everything he had come to hate. He hated the people that fought each other, but then he remembered seeing people that were in love and how happy they were. He hated seeing people die, but he remembered when Mito and Menla were born. He hated his family for leaving him all alone, but he remembered the amazing times they had in the past. He was brought to his own conclusion about the concept of mankind. We hate something only when we once loved it dearly. And if you once loved something dearly, forgiveness is as easy as remembering what you loved before. Naruto feared for his friend, but at the same time couldn't have been happier. For once, he was getting to see his friend genuinely, truly happy. Something he had noticed was becoming more and more scarce. 
There was another book here read, in which the author gave his own description of love as the emotional embodiment of peak human strength. Yet, at the same time, our greatest weakness. A paradox in the truest sense. In both cases, he noticed the outcome of death. Never directly said, but implied both times. Death was inevitable, and in the line of work that he was accustomed to, he knew better than most that death affects the living more than the dead. But, over the time spent with the two in less awkward situations, he became close to Izumi as well. So, the fear of one of their deaths became a lot more worrying. Breaking him from his thoughts was a head of silver hair poking out at a booth a few away from theirs. Thinking it was Kakashi, he almost called out to the man. When the guy stood to his feet it wasn't him. Glad he dodged that awkward conversation, he went back to reading. Again, interrupting his musing was Izumi standing at her feet. It's getting late. I better get home. She waved to the two boys with a smile. Thank you guys so much. This was the most fun I've had all day. Naruto nodded at her with a smile. Itachi however stood to his feet as well. I will walk you home. He said as they bid Naruto a good night. Naruto returned the gesture and headed home himself. He couldn't wait to see what their relationship developed into. Something exquisitely dangerous he presumed. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.